We've seen previously that when two ideal gases mix spontaneously in an isolated container, entropy increases. I want to look again at the entropy change upon the mixing of two ideal gases. This process has important implications for the theory of ideal solutions, solutions of particles that are not interacting with each other through intermolecular forces. And so this is going to be a foundational calculation, actually, for future studies, in particular of chemical equilibrium and the law of mass action. So let's revisit this experiment of starting with two ideal gases on either side of a partition, removing the partition and watching the gases spontaneously mix. Entropy increases during this process, and we can think of it not just as the two gases mixing, but as two different expansion processes taking place. And this is actually a useful way to think about it, as we'll see. So we can imagine, for example, initial volumes of V sub A for the red gas, let's say, and V sub B for the blue gas, and a final volume of V sub A plus V sub B. And we can imagine this mixing process as two individual expansions, right? These are ideal gases, so to some extent, the red gas doesn't know the blue gas is even there, and vice versa. So we can imagine the red gas expanding from VA to VA plus VB, and the blue gas expanding from VB to VA plus VB. What's the entropy change associated with each of these expansions? Well, we can calculate the two separately. So let's think about delta S for the A gas and delta S for the B gas. According to the classical definition of entropy, remember this is just the reversible heat, or the energy dispersed, divided by the temperature at which this is taking place. In a previous video, we worked out the reversible heat for a gas expansion process. It's equal to N, the number of moles of gas, times R, the gas constant, the natural log of the final volume, divided by the initial volume, which in this case is V sub A plus V sub B, divided by V sub A for the red gas, for gas A. We can do the exact same calculation for delta S sub B, Q rev for delta S sub B divided by the temperature. And again, we're looking at an expansion, and so the form of this expression is exactly the same. N sub B times the gas constant times the natural log of the final volume divided by the initial volume, V sub A plus V sub B divided by V sub B. The total entropy change for the entire isolated system is just equal to the sum of the two. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, since we're looking at a perfectly rigid, perfectly insulated system, that is an isolated system, this entropy change better be greater than zero. In fact, if we add the two together and get this expression, we find that this is, in fact, always greater than zero, because the sum of the two volumes, VA plus VB, must be greater than the individual starting volumes, V sub A and V sub B. But now, if pressure and temperature are the same on both sides of the partition, that is, if pressure and temperature are constant throughout this process, we know that the ratio of N to V is a constant. N over V is a constant. That's just Avogadro's law, which is an incarnation of the ideal gas law at constant pressure and temperature. So that means that we can replace each of these volumes inside the natural logarithm with numbers of moles and write the expression you see at the bottom of the slide. The only thing I've done here is I've taken each volume and replaced it with the corresponding number of moles. Na plus Nb divided by Na in the first logarithm, and Na plus Nb divided by Nb in the second logarithm. This is going to lead us, as we'll see in a second, to a more compact expression for the entropy change that uses a more convenient, conceptually convenient, quantity. The thing is, a number of moles divided by a total number of moles is equal to a mole fraction x. So for example, the mole fraction of xA in the mixture, in the final mixture, is equal to the moles of A divided by the total number of moles, n sub A plus n sub B. Notice that in the first natural logarithm, the argument of that natural logarithm is just 1 over xA. And in fact, the same idea applies to the second logarithm, it's really just 1 over xB. So we can replace what's inside the natural logarithm with 1 over xA and 1 over xB and realize that this is just xA to the negative 1 power and this is xB to the negative 1 power and write that delta S, the total entropy change inside the isolated system, is negative N sub A times R times the natural log of X sub A minus N sub B times R times the natural log of X sub B. And the negative signs appear in front of each term because a mole fraction to the negative one power is inside each logarithm. Now let's factor out the gas constant. 
and multiply and divide, and divide by the total number of moles. When we do this, well, when we divide by the total number of moles, let's call it little n without a subscript, we're getting a mole fraction out in front of each term, right? To make sure that this is still equal to delta s, we need to multiply the entire thing by the total number of moles. And so here we can write x sub a, here we can write x sub b, and the overall expression becomes negative n, that's the, that's the total number of moles, times the gas constant, time, times x sub a natural log of x sub a plus x sub b natural log of x sub b is equal to the total change in entropy delta s. The mole fractions are always less than 1, so the natural log terms will always be negative. That means that delta s of mixing for this isolated system will always be positive. And this is exactly what we would expect from the second law of thermodynamics, so it's good that we arrived at this expression. This is a useful expression for the entropy of mixing because it shows us how concentrations, that is, the number of moles of each species in the mixture per the total number of moles, influences delta s, how much the entropy changes for particular concentrations. And concentrations, as we'll see when we talk about equilibrium in a future video series, are all over the place in chemistry and are relatively straightforward to measure. Let's develop some intuition for the, this expression for the change in entropy as a function of the mole fractions of mixing components. One thing it tells us is that since delta S is always greater than zero, the entropy of two separated pure substances is always lower than the entropy of a mixture. And by the way, we won't work with this expression too much, but this generalizes to any number of mixing components as long as we consider them all ideal gases. The total entropy change upon mixing is negative N, the total number of moles, times R, times a sum over all of the components, the mole fraction of that component times the natural log of the mole fraction of that component. So this works for any number of mixing components, and delta S will always be greater than zero, since, again, this natural log is always less than zero, and the negative sign ensures that delta S is positive. So the entropy of any number of substances in pure form is always lower than the entropy of the corresponding mixture. Note also that the entropy change is greatest when xA equals xB equals 0.5, when the number of moles of A and the number of moles of B in the mixture are equal. I would encourage you to actually try this. Try this with xA equal to 0.1, that is 10% of the particles are A, gas A, and 0.9 for xB, 90% of the particles are the B gas. Try it again for equal numbers of moles, 0.5 for the mole fraction of A and 0.5 for the mole fraction of B, and see how delta S varies as that mole fraction changes. Between xA equal to 0, 0.0 and 0, 0.5, delta S increases logarithmically with the mole fraction. So we get an increase up to xA equal to 0, 0.5 that looks something like this. And if we keep calculating as we move to higher and higher mole fractions of A, this actually decreases. So delta S actually decreases back down to zero when the mole fraction of xA is equal to one. And this should make sense because above a mole fraction of 0 0.5, gas A starts predominating over gas B. Since both are ideal gases, there's a symmetry to this graph. Does it make sense that entropy is greater in an ideal solution, this mixture of ideal gases, than in the separate ideal gases? Well, it should. Think back to our idea of entropy as energy dispersal. In the separated gases, the kinetic energy of each is constrained or concentrated in the two compartments, separate from one another. But when we allow, when we, but when we remove the partition and allow the gases to mix, the kinetic energy of both gases becomes dispersed over a larger volume. So entropy increases due to this energy dispersal that's going on. So we've seen that for mixing of ideal gases within an isolated system, delta S mix is always greater than zero. Does this imply then that mixing is always spontaneous for any pair of substances as long as we can assume they're ideal gases? Well, clearly, empirical observations tell us that no, mixing is not always spontaneous. Think about oil and water. We can let oil and water sit forever and they will never spontaneously mix with each other. But the thing to realize about, for example, this oil and water system is that this is, first of all, an open system and it is not an isolated system. So when we think about mixing of oil and water in, say, an open cup in the op open atmosphere, we need to worry 
about the entropy change of the surroundings. Remember, the second law only concerns isolated systems, and it says that the total entropy change in an isolated system must be greater than zero. What we've looked at so far is delta S of mixing for an isolated system only. We haven't even worried about surroundings since we stipulated that the system in which these ideal gases were mixing was isolated. Remember that condition for spontaneity. Delta S cis plus delta S sir must be greater than or equal to zero. So even if the delta S of mixing is positive, a process may still be non-spontaneous in a non-isolated system like this if delta S of the surroundings is negative enough. This points to the idea that we really need to think about delta S of the surroundings in more detail, especially since, for all intents and purposes, perfectly isolated systems are impossible to achieve in practice. In the next video, we're going to recast delta S of the surroundings in terms of the system. This is highly convenient from a computational and chemical perspective since the chemical system is really what we care about. Using what we call suitably constructed surroundings, strategically constructed surroundings, we can recast the second law in terms of the system only.